So our next speaker is Gary Briggs. He's joining us from the University of Santa Cruz. He works in ocean sciences. His area of research focuses on the shoreline, erosion processes, sea levels, and how best we can protect our coastlands from the upcoming zombie of cop apocalypse. His first pet was a Doberman named Dobie. Duh, that's pretty cool. Go <laughs> creative, that's great. He will be speaking to us today on climate change and how that affects the Monterey Bay area. At least that's what I assume he's going to be talking to us about. Gary. So thank you for inviting me today. This is my first acquaintance with science skeptics or skeptical scientists or whatever. Um, the shoreline is one of the most important lines on the planet. And the shoreline is moving, it's moving towards us, it's moving inland, and it's moving because sea level is rising, and sea level is rising because the earth is warming and ice is melting. And all, my, all ice melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> so given the nature of this uh, event, and I hope these quotes are attributed correctly now, um, I just thought I'd start with two, um, not knowing anything about this group before I came. But I think they say something about um, science uh, and people's opinions versus facts that are important to keep in mind today. Um, so we knew for a long time uh, that climate was different across the globe. People had gone to the pole, people had gone to the tropics and realized that climate varied from place to place, but it wasn't until about the early part of the 1800s uh, when people began to get a sense that not only climate varied across the globe, but climate also may have changed over time. And uh, one of the first real active proponents of that was a geologist named Louis Agassiz, who was actually Swiss. He had some attributes that many scientists and academics don't. He was articulate, charming, and ambitious. <laughs> but he noticed um, something that many people have subsequently noticed, um, things called glacial erratics. And these are large boulders, some the size of cars, buses, sitting in the middle of a field or in a place where they don't belong. And began to look at Modern glaciers realized glaciers carried a lot of material, and when they melted and retreated, they left this material behind. He also noticed a lot of places, and we can see this in Yosemite and the Canadian Shield and the Great Lakes, where glaciers have moved across the landscape. They've actually pulled those rocks along and have left um, tracks or trails or grooves indicating that it had been glaciated in the past. Um, so that he made the argument that, in fact, the ice had been much more extensive and the Earth had actually gone through ice ages throughout its history. And it took a while to identify that evidence, and now we know pretty well where those um, glaciers have been. Much of North America was glaciated. We know the Great Lakes were scoured out, Cape Cod. Um, in fact, we named the glaciations by how far south they advanced. We've got the Nebraska and the Kansas and the Illinois. And, mm. But we know Seattle, for example, was under about 3,000 feet of ice at the end of the last ice age, um, before places like Costco and other things like <laughs> Starbucks. Um, and so just to give you some comparison, the space needle is about 600 feet high. So 3,000 feet was a lot of ice. Um, and when we put that ice on the continents, and there was a series of ice ages that went on over several million years and in the geologic past much further back, we had to get that moisture from someplace, and it came out of the ocean. So sea level during those ice ages dropped about 350 to 400 feet. So we took about 10 million cubic miles of seawater put it on the continents as ice caps and glaciers, which drop sea level 400 feet. So we know, we believe, that our earliest inhabitants of North America came across the Bering Straits from Asia, and we now have pretty good genetic information about that. Because sea level was lower, this was all exposed so they could get through. It turns out most recent evidence indicate 
maybe 25,000 years ago, they spent perhaps 10,000 years uh, in this area where there's a lot of big game because there wasn't an ice-free passage in. Gradually, they worked their way down through the Americas, um, in fact, got to the tip of South America almost 15,000 years ago, which surprised people. They'd moved that fast. They also could have moved along the shoreline in what's now been called the Kelp Highway. Um, so, 51 years ago, um, I was starting graduate school at Oregon State University in oceanography and spent a fair amount of time in the North Pacific, which wasn't always the most pleasant place. Um, but what we were doing was basically um, early climate work, and we were using uh, a deep sea core, basically a pipe with a big weight on it, dropping that into the seafloor. We were in 10 to 12,000 feet of water, bringing back cores of sediment, and then looking at the record contained in the sediment. So the ocean basins are a huge repository for everything that's happening in the oceans and in the atmosphere, and so organisms that live and die, volcanic eruptions, micrometeorites, all get into the water, sink to the seafloor, and are recorded in those sediments. So we were going back um, 10, 15, 20, 30,000 years in sediments, um, and one of the things that was became clear 51 years ago as I was starting to do this work is when we looked at the, the most surficial sediments, they were dominated, the plankton, by uh, a group of plankton called radiolaria, um, animals that leave skeletons made out of silica. These are microscopic, very delicate. And as we got deeper into these cores, there started to be a transition. We started seeing, I'm sorry, I've reversed these radial area. We started seeing planktonic foraminifera that are another microscopic organism. And we could actually plot the abundance of these and see warm or interglacial periods and glacial periods, the record of these ice ages. Um, I was a little younger then. <laughs> I was under 30 and you could trust me. <laughs> so we've now, um, developed a pretty good record of climate going back over geologic time. We've been drilling into the seafloor since 1968 in a series of programs, ocean drilling, deep sea drilling. We have now gone back about 65 million years, coring into the seafloor, bringing back sediment samples, looking at their fossil record, their dates, and looking at climate recorded in different ways. We've um, now been drilling into the ice of Antarctica and Greenland, and ice contains climate records, um, different isotopes, uh, atmospheric uh, compositional change, and when ice freezes, it, little bits of air um, are frozen into that. Even in California, we have really old trees down in the southeastern part of the state, bristlecone pine, that live as long as 5,000 years, and we can actually use something probably most of you have heard of, dendrochronology, looking at tree rings and get ideas about climate and whether it was warm or cold or wet or dry. And in addition to tropical coral, there are also deep sea coral. We have these off in 10,000 feet of water that actually grow to be perhaps as old as 10,000 years. And they actually put on rings like um, trees do. And those have been recovered recently, uh, and we started to get climate records. So we have climate records from different places on the planet going back different periods of time. So why does climate change? I mean, those are things going back hundreds of thousands and millions of years. It's a complicated topic, but there are lots of natural changes that have occurred ever since we've had an Earth. And one of the major sets of factors affecting climate on Earth is our relationship to the sun, basically the distance to the sun that determines how much heat we get. So we know now, um, and actually this was worked out over a century ago, before we had computers, um, that the Earth doesn't have a smooth <coughs> rotation of orbit, but in fact it has a wobble on its axis, like a clock. It has a cycle of about 26,000 years, and sometimes it's 21 or 26 or 25, but generally in that order, 
Um, so it actually comes back to where it was before after about 26,000 years. It also has a tilt, and that's what gives us the seasons. And that tilt, though, varies over a couple of degrees. So if this is the sun, and this is the earth, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we're having our summer, and the southern hemisphere is tilted away from it, they're in winter, and we get around to this side again, the southern hemisphere is now closer, they're having summer, we're having winter. But that tilt changes over a couple of degrees that determines how cool or how warm it is. And it has a cycle of 41,000 years. And then our orbit around the sun isn't a circle, but it's an ellipse. And it has a cycle of about 100,000 years. So each of those is acting together to determine how much heat we get from the sun. And why do we have this happening to begin with? Well. This is fairly recent, um, and a colleague at UC Santa Cruz, actually one of the people that came up with this idea that explained a lot of things that weren't very clear to us, and I think probably the great bulk of Earth and planetary sciences now, scientists now feel this is the case, but early in our history, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. I have to tell you a story, though, a quick aside. As, as an undergraduate, uh, one day the professor came into class and said, you know, they thought the Earth was two billion years old, but we know it's four and a half billion. We've got some older rocks and data things. And he said, in another four and a half million years, Earth's going to end. The sun's going to burn out, and the student in the back starts kind of worrying. And he sticks his hand up. He says, the professor asked him, do you have a question? He says, yeah, did you say four and a half billion years or four and a half million years? And he said, four and a half billion. The guy says, oh, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> so geologic time is a bit different. Um, we think clearly in terms of much shorter periods of time. But within probably the first hundred million years of Earth history, when the Earth was still molten, we believe that the Earth was hit by a planetary body You've been given a name, Thea. And that did a couple of things. First, a lot of the, the heavier molten mass from that other body was about the size of Mars, coalesced with the Earth and gave us a heavier core. Took off some of the surface material, so the continents don't really cover the whole surface of the Earth, but it also shoved the Earth off a nice circular orbit and gave it a tilt and this aberration in its orbit. So, it makes a certain amount of sense, and it may explain those cycles I just gave you, which in fact have been called the Milankovitch cycles over a Yugoslavian engineer who figured out these things, which is rather amazing to stop and think about figuring these things out <coughs> over 100 years ago with a slide rule or an abacus or whatever we were using at the, at the time. So um, back in the 1890s, a Swedish Nobel Prize winning chemist actually discovered or realized that carbon dioxide, I'm not sure he called it a greenhouse gas, but it would trap heat. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would trap heat, and it, along with methane, nitrous oxide, and a few other things, actually produce a natural greenhouse effect. So without those gases, the average Earth temperature would be zero. Instead, it's about 60, which makes the Earth habitable. So there is a natural greenhouse effect, and there are natural climate changes, independent of humans being on the planet. So the greenhouse effect is physical science, not political science. Amen, brother. <laughs> it happens. And we can go back now. We started measuring temperature sort of on a regular basis back about 1880. And if we look, if I just showed you nothing else but this, you'd say, well, OK. If we look at carbon dioxide content going up and global temperature, you see some relationship. This stops in 2013, but in fact, it's continuing to go up. Um, one of the complications in what, what it is happening with those uh, atmospheric or those astronomical cycles with the Earth's wobble and its tilt and its orbit, are there some feedback effects? And we have positive feedback and negative feedback. And I'm sure that's 
comfortable to all of you, but I think about a positive feedback in a very simple way. If you had children and your children do well in school, they get all A's on the report card, you give them something, a new computer, and say, oh, okay, now I'll do even better next year. That's sort of a positive feedback. Or your child comes home with D's and asks them to beat the crap out of them, and he continues to do bad in school. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but <laughs> positive and negative. So there are some other things, whether those astronomical cycles can bring on an ice age or not, is not completely clear, but it certainly can be a catalyst for some of these feedbacks. So a, a couple of those. Um, one is uh, ice and the reflectivity of solar energy, or its albedo. So if we have an ice surface, if it's Greenland or Antarctica, um, it reflects about 60% of that heat. If it's open ocean, it reflects about 6% on average, and it absorbs the rest of that heat. So when sunlight falls on the ocean, it warms up the ocean. When it hits ice, a fair amount of that is reflected back. So as the Earth starts to warm from those astronomical cycles, and the ice starts to melt back, the ocean absorbs more of the heat than the ice did, and it starts to get a little warmer. So that's a positive feedback. Similarly, the ocean, when it gets warmer, the ocean has a lot of carbon dioxide in solution. In fact, about 50 times as much as the atmosphere. So if the ocean burps, which has happened in the past, we can release a lot of carbon dioxide in a hurry and change temperature fairly quickly. As the ocean warms up from these natural cycles of the Earth and its orbit, it starts to give off CO2 because warmer water will hold less dissolved gas. So that'll again put more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, another <coughs> positive feedback loop. And methane is contained along with carbon dioxide and so forth in permafrost. And as the earth starts to warm, the permafrost starts to thaw, more CO2 and methane are given off, which again enhances that greenhouse gas effect. So these are all feedback loops that amplify those. And this is a big part of global climate change that we're just starting to figure out how important that is. But large parts of the Northern Hemisphere are underlain by permanently frozen soil, rock, that has a lot of preserved or organic matter that will begin to release greenhouse gas when it thaws. So these can also go the other way. Um, in those ice cores in Antarctica that have now gone back around 850,000 years, back uh, roughly two miles, and this looks like a nice sunny day in Antarctica, but in fact, I have some colleagues who work. It's not a particularly pleasant place to work. You know, in fact, you can die in a few minutes in Antarctica by getting lost in a whiteout and getting outside your tent and so forth. So, but we have been very successful in drilling down 11,500 feet, and what we get in those ice cores, and this is going back a little over 800,000 years to the present, and again, we can look in the core and extract little bits of air molecules that were frozen in the time that ice formed and measure its carbon dioxide content. And it turns out for 850,000 years, that CO2 content is varied between about 175 parts per million and 300 parts per million. And these cycles, if you look at them, are sort of the, those 100,000 year cycles of the Earth's orbit around the sun, which makes it warmer, cooler, and we get more or less carbon dioxide. Um, and then some of those smaller 40,000 and so forth year cycles. So what's happened recently, carbon dioxide is now at 407 parts per million, or about a 44% increase over sort of what it was here for at least the last 850,000 years. We just haven't dr drilled back further yet. And these are some of the possible higher levels of carbon dioxide that could happen if we keep burning fossil fuels and producing carbon dioxide. Now, back in the 50s, um, the then director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Roger Avell, who was a brilliant guy, 
had the idea then that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was increasing. He knew about Arrhenius's work on the greenhouse effect. And so he talked to a young scientist at the time, a guy named Charles Keeling, and said, I want you to go to Hawaii and set up a station to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it's not much industry, it's an undisturbed area. Charles fought that for a while. He didn't really want to go to Hawaii for his life. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> he did. In fact, he set up an instrument and began measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, he continued that from the, the mid-50s to early 2000s. Charles died. He got the National Medal of Honor. And now his son, Ralph, is actually continuing that work. But what's interesting is not only is carbon dioxide increasing, but the rate is increasing. Um, And we could say a lot more about this, but these are just measurements. We're taking measurements from the atmosphere, and you might wonder about this sort of jog every year. So this is just winter, summer. So in the summer months or spring of plant growth, they're taking carbon dioxide out, and in the winter months, carbon dioxide is increasing. So there's this sort of jagged line. So where is it coming from? And this is probably uh, something you are all aware of. <coughs> Roughly 91% of that, this is a couple of years old, is coming from burning coal, oil, natural gas, and actually cement. Production of cement produces about 5% of the CO2. So we make cement by heating up limestone, calcium carbonate, and when we do that, we produce calcium oxide, which is lime, a building block of cement, and CO2. So for every ton of cement we make, we produce a ton of CO2. So that's a an important factor. Um, land use changes, burning of tropical rainforest and all the other things. I don't know how much carbon dioxide the Silberani's fire this last year produced, but you can bet there was a lot of CO2 that went into the atmosphere. Where does it go? A little less than half goes into the atmosphere. About 26% is taken up by terrestrial vegetation, and about 30% goes into the oceans. And a topic that's becoming of increasing concern is something called ocean acidification, which is another negative side effect of this, which we can measure and is beginning to have measurable effects. So, in the next hour, the world will use about 4 million barrels of oil, a million tons of coal, which all produce carbon dioxide. But we're really not running out of fossil fuels, we're running out of atmosphere. So that's something that um, we really can't easily see, but we can measure. Um, to put the sort of global temperature in some perspective, again, we started measuring temperatures regularly about 1880, so we now have 136 or so years. And if we look at the average for that period of time, we call that zero, and look at the other years compared to that, sort of an anomaly, we can see for the first 50 or so years, it was colder than that average. And there's been some bumps in here from various natural cycles. But this is what we see over the last 40 or so years, 40 or 50 years. Um, so we're now actually maybe a degree, getting close to a degree centigrade or a degree and a half Fahrenheit above where we started, actually probably We've exceeded that at this point. And there's lots of numbers that get put out about 2016 was the warmest year on record, and 2015 was the warmest year before that, 2014. So of the 16 warmest years in the last 136 years, with the exception of a, of a 1998 El Nino, all the rest of those have occurred in the last 15 years. So we're, we're getting warmer each year. Um, this is a NASA temperature plot that's looking at global temperatures over that period of time, 1880 to the present. And let's see if we can just make this go here. So this is showing, according to that long-term average, sort of what things are from blue being cooler than average and yellow or orange. So we're now up to the 1930s. These are in sort of five-year increments. And the poles tend to be affected more than the mid-latitudes, particularly as you get here to the, closer to the present. 
So by this scale, you can see um, this would be two degrees or more above the long-term average centigrade, and then below that, which is a few areas in the southern. So it's just trying to look over time at what's been what's been happening. So what's the difference between climate and weather? It's been said that climate's what we predict and weather's what we get. <laughs> in some ways that's true. Climate is long-term, weather is today, the storm, so forth. Um, are the last five dry years a manifestation of global climate change? It would be hard to pick this storm or last summer or the year before or the year before and say, um, based on a few years, um, which are weather, that that's an indication of long-term climate change. But we start to look, either in California or around the world, this would be an easier talk to give if it hadn't started raining this year, um, that we're seeing so the plot I just showed you of those changing global temperatures. There's, we're beginning to see a number of signs that suggest pretty strongly that, in fact, climate is changing, greenhouse gases are going up, and that there may be some connection. And Clearly there are natural cycles, and those are the things we started with. So we can look at the wobble and the tilt and the eccentricity, but those take place over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. There's other short-term cycles like sunspots that have a cycle of 11 years. There's volcanic eruptions that may affect climate or weather for a year or two. <clears throat> and there are people who say, well, this is all perfectly natural. If we took those natural cycles, um, and looked at where the temperature should be. This is sort of the green band here. Those astronomical cycles should now be taking us down into a cooler period, heading towards another glacial cycle. If we look at the actual temperature measurements, we see the black line, and if we put those natural cycles in with what we can determine from anthropogenic sources, greenhouse gases, we get a very different picture. So the temperature that we're measuring is tracking those anthropogenic sources as well as the natural cycles. And these are bands because those aren't things we know all that precisely. So this may be appropriate for this group in particular. Um, so 97% of climate scientists agree that anthropogenic AGW, global warming, is in fact reality. And we use different words. It's dominantly, high probability, the major cause. But yet when we get to the general public, over half thinks it's not subtle. We don't know. Why is that? I think there's a couple of reasons. One is... Uh, what these people, the general public, whoever that happens to be, what they read. <clears throat> and I think it's probably true that most of us identify with a group, <laughs> a clan, a political philosophy, and we read and listen to those sources, and it reinforces what we believe. So if you listen to a certain kind of news, you get the same kind of stuff over and over again. If you read a certain newspaper, you get the same things. But I think also, the press, the media, if there's one opposing view, that's given as much credence as all the scientists in the world. No matter uh, whether that's a climate scientist or a skeptic, I'll use that word, it's given as much credence as everybody else. Um, so in fact, the public doesn't know what to believe. In fact, I think half the people in the country do not believe in evolution, which is another issue. Question. So there was a discussion a little bit earlier this week on NPR about um, groups of people, um, having a group control the week. So there wasn't uh, too, much, too much of a um, deviance from the belief within the group. Right. And I think, to be perfectly honest, another big issue is many scientists do science because they like science. They like the lab, they like the field, they like investigation and trying to understand things and whatever the, is the science they do. But very few of those people really like to talk to the public <laughs> or do very well at it. It's 
they don't get credit for it, they think it downgrades their science, so they go to their AGU meetings, or their GSA meetings, their AAS meetings, and talk to their colleagues and publish in their journals. So I think we as scientists have dropped the ball in, in many ways. Um, I've actually been writing a column in the Santa Cruz paper for the last eight years called Our Ocean Backyard, trying every other weekend to put some story in. I say educate, not advocate, so people can begin to understand some of the things that they see around them all the time, like this. But I still find people write in a blog after I say something about climate and say, don't you know that's been debunked? So, uh, anyway, so this is an interesting uh, question that um, probably will haunt us for a long time. And, and I'll say, what if 97% of the scientists are right? Um, we could go on on that for quite a while. So how is changing climate likely to affect the Monterey Bay region? Well, we finished a sort of a climate change vulnerability assessment for Santa Cruz a couple of years ago at the request of, of the city of Santa Cruz. And, but it's probably pretty similar to this end of the bay. And these are not only looking at trends, but also looking at climate models. And modeling is becoming more and more common today. We model everything. Um, and I will say about models, models or models are all wrong. <laughs> Hopefully, over time, they begin to at least give us some sense of what factors are more important or less important in, in the processes we're looking at. So for example, putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot of different models saying how that's going to affect the future. But we believe that it's going to get warmer with more hot days and more higher temperatures. That's not a big stretch. We've seen that happen over the last century. Drier with more droughts, probably more wildland fires. As the oceans get warmer, they evaporate more water, puts more water into the atmosphere, and we think we're going to get more concentrated winter rainfall. I feel really safe saying that on a... <laughs> you say, God, that guy's really smart. <laughs> Which means, you know, likely more flooding. Continuing rise in sea level, because that's directly related to temperature. The more ice melts, the more sea level rises, and also, something I didn't mention at the time, as water warms, it expands. So we get thermal expansion of the ocean as well. Erosion and inundation of the shoreline. So, question, about the water, where's Monterey Peninsula water going to come from in the future? And that's a question I think the whole globe has to answer. California certainly been struggling with it, not today, but for the last five years. The rivers are flowing, the reservoirs are filling up, but the groundwater is going to take a long time to fill up. So we've still got some major depths. This just isn't all over because it started raining. While on fires, this is a huge one this last year. I mean, there was two, another one up at Loma Prieta. Um, Flooding, more concentrated winter rainfall, streams are going to respond with flooding, and we've had our experience with that in the historic past. Sea level rise, um, we actually measure that. We measured it for a long time for other reasons. And this is a little, um, these are NOAA tide gauges. They're originally put in to figure out what happened to different tide stages so ships could go in and out of harbors. But what it has told us over time, and there are dozens of these around the world, is that sea level is rising. Now, Monterey has a, doesn't go back that far into the 70s. Uh, it's a little irregular. Um, and San Francisco goes back as the oldest one in the country, goes back to 1850. But what this is showing is seasonal and other effects, and then the long-term sea level rise. So, Monterey um, shows roughly five and a half inches per century. One and a half, 1.4 millimeters per year, about the thickness of a dime. San Francisco is a bit higher, um, and it's a lot longer. These are actually El Nino years, when sea level rises for a foot or so for two or three months at a time. So those are really important over the short term. In fact, that 30 centimeters is you know, looking out here, we're dozens of years into the future before we get to that level. But this happens now during El Nino years. One of the challenges with um, these measurements are they're taken from tide gauges. And tide gauges are anchored to the land. So they reflect what the land's doing. 
and what the ocean is doing. So if the land is rising, which is doing in Alaska since it was covered with ice, it was depressed, it's now rebounding, that takes thousands of years. If it's rebounding faster than sea level's rising, <laughs> sea level's actually dropping relative to land in Alaska. There's places like New Orleans and Venice that are sinking. So if New Orleans is sinking and sea level is rising, that rise rate is much, much higher. So we've been using these gauges for a long time. And we can go back about, well, this is at the time the last ice age ended 20,000 years ago, this is where sea level was, roughly 400 feet below present. A number of lines of evidence from information left behind in sediment records and so forth that it looks like from about 18,000 years ago to about 8,000 years ago, sea level rose pretty quickly. As the last ice age ended, things got warm, almost four feet per hundred years. So today the global average is maybe a third of this. It rose really quickly. And even within that, we think there were some pulses when sea level was rising even faster, almost an inch a year. And there was just an article that came out this week, was in the paper this morning, New York Times, of this Larson Sea Ice Shelf. <laughs> in Antarctica, a larger crack has opened up and it's close to breaking off a chunk of ice the size of somewhere between Rhode Island and Delaware. That size of, this is the third big chunk that's breaking off. So once that ice shelf breaks off, these huge glaciers can start to advance at a faster rate. They're sort of held in by these corks. So we think this is ice sheet breakup and rapid melt that could happen at any time. And this is becoming of concern because some new work in Antarctica. State of California has just established a new sort of a group to look at. We, we know up till four or five years ago, what projections for sea level rise exist along the California coast. Now the governor wants to know, how is all this likely to affect California coast? We've got lots of people, lots of real estate, power plants, sewage treatment plants, bridges, highways, sitting very close to sea level. San Francisco International <coughs> Airport goes underwater with 16 inches of sea level rise. You can see how they go to Oakland. <laughs> Oakland also does. <laughs> And that committee is going to start meeting within the next couple of weeks um, to look at that issue. What can California face in the future? And I will have some input because I got asked to chair that committee. So we'll see what's going to happen. Um, but as we continue on forward, um, beginning about 8,000 years ago, sea level more or less leveled off. And for 8,000 years, it changed very little, less than a millimeter per year. This corresponds to the whole period of human civilization. Mm -hmm. Sea level was flat, essentially flat. In most of the early civilizations, whether it was the Egyptians and the Nile, the Tigris Euphrates, the civilizations in China, <coughs> grew up along coastal plains and deltas where they could farm and they had agriculture. Um, so it was stable, it allowed that to happen. Right now, this is the rate we're looking at from um, present measurements of about 13 inches per century. But in all likelihood, that rate's going to increase along with greenhouse gases and temperature. And I believe this may be the biggest challenge human civilization has ever faced. I don't say that lightly, but about half the world's people live within 100 feet of sea level. 150 million people live within three feet of high tide. And you look around at the biggest cities in the world, almost all of them are on coasts. So, again, we used tide gauges up until 1993. And the problem is they're tied to the land. So somebody had the great idea, well, let's measure it from space. So we launched a couple of satellites that are measuring it very precisely from space involves some pretty delicate measurements of knowing exactly where those satellites are all the time. And the numbers we're now getting are almost double what the last century showed, um, 
four millimeters per year. Around 2010-11, it looked like this was dropping off, and there were those people who said, it's okay, we're home free. <laughs> but in fact, there are going to be blips. We need to look at the long term. But there's a big amount of future uncertainty. Where's it going to go next? <laughs> if I show this to my students, they don't, they don't know who this is. <laughs> uh, so you may remember this quote, there are the known knowns, the known, the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns. And these are some of those. What are natural climate variations? How about future greenhouse gas emissions? Falling of permafrost, release of carbon. How fast will Greenland melt? And there's some new indications that Greenland is melting faster than we had thought. And then what's going to happen with this ice flow from Antarctica? Question? Yeah, in terms of critical uh, impact to mankind, what are we talking about in terms of time? 50 years, 100 years, 500 years? Just based on that scale that you just showed. Uh, the time when it begins to impact people? Yeah, noticeable impact, <coughs> recognizable impact to the Okay, I, I think I'll get to that, but if I don't, we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, so these are things we don't know about. That's why the uncertainty of the future is that well, you scientists don't know what you're doing. Well, what we don't know is what's going to happen in the U.S. How much more coal will we burn? How many more renewables will we use? How much will we use solar power? What's going to happen in China is another big one, India, and so forth. So there's a lot of uncertainties that are social, political issues, not scientific issues. So here are three of the big reservoirs. Mountain glaciers of the world, if we melt all those, the Himalayas, the Andes, the Alps, Alaska, we could produce about two feet of sea level rise. And that's happening now, those glaciers are retreating slowly. Greenland. Any guess on how much sea level rise equivalent in Greenland? 20 feet. 20 feet? Great. 20, 22, sometimes we say 7 meters. Um, so that's big. Would that take care of us here? I think we're okay here. New York, Newark, Tokyo, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Jakarta, Mumbai, London. How about Antarctica? Lawrence, 200. 200, good. So we've got about 225 feet of sea level rise equivalent in all the ice. And to answer your question one way, nobody thinks that's going to happen this century or the next century. So we're okay. Someone said if the world makes it to 2100, I think we're okay. Okay, one, one thing you, you may be familiar with over there in Santa Cruz, but it's affecting us more in Monterey, is uh, the CMEX plant. And apparently beaches restore themselves, but they're pulling out thousands of tons of sand to make cement in Mexico. And it's eroding our shore. So not only is the sea rising, but our coasts and our shores are sinking because of that, especially on our end of the bay. So much where they've already started putting up seawalls around some condos, around a hotel. Down I'll there. get to that in just a second. Good question. They're going right. to think I planted him there. <laughs> so I was going to do this really quickly. This is um, a quick video of uh, a group that was looking at a glacier in Greenland trying to monitor what was happening. And it comes from a movie called Chasing Ice. on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. <laughs> 
with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Jim, just nothing's happening. Yeah. Uh, it's going well. We had uh, some serious bouts of wind, but other than that, things are fairly well set up. Here we've got. It's starting out of, I think, kind of starting. Let me call you back. Call back. Okay, back. Yeah, in that V section right there. Holy shit, look at that big bird rolling. A little far right, right? Look at that. were shooting up out of the ocean 600 feet and then falling. The only way that you can really try to put it into scale with human reference is if you imagine Manhattan. And all of a sudden, all of those buildings just start to rumble and quake and peel off and just fall over and fall over and roll around. This whole massive city just breaking apart in front of your eyes. <coughs> We're just observers, these two little dots on the side of the mountain. And we watched and recorded the largest witness cabin event ever caught on tape. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. Thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. So 
we're looking at long-term sea level rise. We have 250 feet of sea level that's not going to rise instantly. Several centuries, 500 years. We don't really know those uncertainties. Um, but what we are seeing is these extreme short-term events. Um, this month we'll have king tides, which are the extreme in the position between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun that, that bring us the, the greatest amount of gravitational attraction, so we'll get these extreme high tides. This is a couple years ago. The Embarcadero in San Francisco without any more high tide is already lapping up on the sidewalks. So I think it's these short-term events, these extreme events, that are going to be more problematic in our lifetimes. This is in Capitola. Um, stream high tide, El Nino events, um, storm surge and high tides. Um, brought up Monterey Beach Hotel. Um, and uh, it's sort of sitting out there, hanging out. Wish um, <laughs> Harbor House um, is another example. And you're exactly right, I've been involved in the CMEX sand mining issue for 30 some years, which they're finally getting they closer to. They haven't stopped though. No, no, they haven't. That's a, that's a perennial <coughs> issue. But it's clear this, is, this has been eroding at about two feet per year, and up here maybe three or four feet per year. So <coughs> sea level rise is a long term <coughs> issue, but these high tides, extreme wave events are going to be another. So there are, and this is not rock, it's sand, so it's going to erode a lot quicker. So what are the options for the future? Um, so I'll just say from my perspective that for a whole bunch of reasons we need to address the impacts of climate change now, whether it's military or social or political or economic or moral. Um, so we're really the first generation to feel the impacts of climate change, but maybe the last generation to do something about it. <coughs> and these are really not technical decisions about peripheral matters, but they're really about who we are, you know, what matters to us, what kind of world we want to live in, what kind of world we want our children to live in, kind of fundamental issues. And there's basically three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. <laughs> We're already doing some of each, and the only question in the future is what the proportion will be. So by mitigation, we're trying to cut back. Cut back our burning of fossil fuels, for example. Adaptation, we know it's happening. What are we going to do in response and suffering? I think we all know what that is. So give you <coughs> one bright spot for California. Um, we are now 27.5% renewable, country is about half of that, but interesting if we look at installed solar capacity, this goes up to 2011, but that's where we are today. So Whoa. it's often being said that you can't have, you can't save the environment and still have a healthy economy. California without question has the strongest environmental regulations in the country, whether it's cap and trade, whether it's auto emissions, whether it's sustainable <coughs> energy targets, yeah, we are the sixth largest economy in the world. So, and there's a lot of interesting things going on now with hiring Harry Holder, for example. Um, so I'll leave you with five two-word sentences. It's real. It's bad. It's us. Scientists agree, and there's hope in California. <laughs> Thank you very much. science. So uh, we're going to take a five minute break because we're a little behind. Get up, stretch your legs, get yourself some coffee, come back. We're going to talk about uh, some politics.